Well, good afternoon. It is almost time to start. According to my good watch, we have 10 seconds, and we're going to get started on time And because we have a, a mission report from the Philippines we want to listen to also, and that will discuss a little bit about witnessing and giving a mission report. And so we'd like to begin with a word of prayer for this session of the uh, material, especially for youth or young in heart. And so we'd like to invite you to kneel or pray, as, uh, bow your heads as we pray. <clears throat> Our Father in heaven, I want to thank you so much for the opportunity we have to serve you and to share in this little way something that might be interesting and informative, but also uh, inspiring and from uh, things that will help us to know about your love and your goodness better. And I pray that you'll bless me, Father. I need you at this time, and I pray that your people will receive a rich blessing. And I thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, for those of you who don't know me yet, my name is Pastor Alan Stump. Sometimes they call me PA for Pastor Alan. And you may think I'm trying to imitate Bill Nye, the science guy, but I'm really PA, the real science guy, much better, because my science will always agree with the Word of God and with the Bible and inspiration. But today we're going to be talking about um, gravity and God, trusted friends, trusted friends, gravity and God. But we're going to be talking about two things today. We're going to be talking about gravity and we're going to be talking about God. Well, the first trusted friend we want to talk about today is gravity. And here we see a picture that's a strange looking picture, but it's actually something that scientists theorize is how gravity affects things. Going on to slide number three, it says that gravity is usually considered a force that attracts objects to each other or pulls them toward the center of the Earth. But according to the general theory of relativity, gravity is also considered a consequence of the curvature of space-time caused by the uneven distribution of mass. So according to uh, Einstein's theory of relativity, general theory of relativity, that every, all the space around us isn't simply space, but it's something that we call space-time. And that mass has an effect of warping or curving this space-time, as we see in the uh, close-up of the next slide, which we had earlier. And that then pulls, or like, like if you had a sheet, and, and you had a, a ball on one side of the sheet, but then if there was something down in the middle of the sheet, if you put a weight down the middle of the sheet, it would, it would put a dimple in the sheet and things would tend to roll toward it. Gravity is considered one of four fundamental forces in the universe, along with the electromagnetic force and the strong and the weak nuclear forces. Now, we've all probably seen pictures of astronauts where they're floating in space or in their spacecrafts and they don't have any gravity. Uh, at least the, the effect of gravity is so weak where they're at that they don't really feel it. And we look at this and we think, well, you know, that might be really fun. It'd be really great to do something like that. And how could I ever simulate gravity or the lack of gravity without being in outer space? Well, NASA has come up with something that they call zero G, or better known as the Vomit Comet. And this is a special an airplane that has the middle, the inside of it gutted out and just padded around with padding all around it. And they fly a parabolic kind of uh, curve. And as they go up, there's a certain amount of g-force. But as they go down at the right angle and the right speed, it creates a, a sense of weightlessness. I have seen this happen before. My father was a, a, a private pilot when I was a young, young boy. And there would be times we'd go up in an airplane and he would do this similar kind of flying. He would fly up and then he'd fly down very hard and he could take, my dad unfortunately was a smoker, but he could take his pack of cigarettes and they would just hang in the airplane because they were falling at the same rate the airplane was and so the effect was no gravity. That was the effect. And we see some pictures here in the bottom of this slide. You might recognize on the left, lower left picture, Sir Richard Branson in that group. But here they are, they're, they're in this zero-g airplane during its descending part of the parabola. And then on the right, there's another picture of some folks. And you see there's just re there really is no up, down, left, or right in a situation like that. Now, no gravity, not having gravity, might sound like a lot of fun. And I suppose it could be a lot of fun for a short period of time, just like getting on a roller coaster might be good for a short period of time. But most of us wouldn't want to live on a roller coaster. 
But it can also be a lot of trouble to live in a zero uh, G environment, no gravity environment. How would you ever be able to play catch if you missed the ball? You'd keep going, it would never stop. Or you'd have to have a special toilet. That's no fun. Some people become sick and nauseated in this situation. That's why the airplane we saw a little bit ago has been nicknamed the Vomit Comet. Some of you ladies will really appreciate this next one because gravity does not promote good hair days. Gravity does not promote good hair days. It promotes bad hair days. Uh, if you like to burn candles in our 10th slide, we see that candles don't look the same when you burn them in an atmosphere that doesn't have gravity. Not having gravity might sound like a lot of fun, but it can also be a lot of trouble to deal with every day and night. It also has health risks involved. For instance, the body has a redistribution of, of its bodily fluids and liquids, and this is actually counter uh, positive to things that our body is used to doing. Your eyeballs uh, tend to become more perfectly round, but they're not uh, been used to that, and that creates eye vision problems. There's muscle atrophy and osteoporosis. Now, in the last few years, there's been this idea that maybe there's no such thing as a, a spherical Earth, and that there's this theory that some people propose called the flat Earth theory. And with that, there's the idea that there's no such real thing as gravity. But if we would go to slide number 12, here we see a picture of the Grand Canyon. Anyone who doesn't believe in gravity to go to the point that they show and just take one more step. And I think they'll find out really quick that there is such a thing as gravity. But my background in, in education, at least, was mathematics and science. And I've studied a lot of physics, a lot of mathematics, and I know that a great many of the uh, formulas and, and the knowledge that we have of physics is based upon our understanding of gravity. And if there was no true gravity, then many other things that we take for granted that we work out just couldn't exist, they wouldn't work out. But in slide 13, we see here a formula that you probably learned in high school, maybe even in junior high or sometime. And this tells us of, of the distance that an object falls, free falls, when it's dropped from a particular height. It says, on Earth, the force of gravity upon a falling object is expressed in the following formula, d equals 1 half gt squared, where d is the distance something drops, g is the gravitational constant of 9.8 meters per second squared, and t is the time in seconds. What this says to us is, as an example, is that the first second minus the effects of friction, because there is a, a minute amount of friction in the air if something's just dropping a short distance, but if it's dropping for like several thousand feet, the air does actually have a significant friction effect. But for things just dropping a few feet, it really is almost negligible. But it means that in the first second, an object will drop 4.9 meters in the first second, which is equivalent to about 16 feet. In two seconds, an object falls 19.6 meters, or about 64 feet total. Now, we're going to do an experiment. We want to find out if this law of gravity really works and is consistent. And so the way we're going to do that, we're going to look at some bullets here. Okay. So and here we have a lineup of about seven different uh, shells, di different ballistics. This first one is a 22 long rifle uh, rimfire uh, bullet. Then we have a, uh, a 380 ACP uh, bullet. We have a, a 9 millimeter Luger bullet. We have a 38 special, a 40 caliber bullet a 357 Magnum, and a 5.56 uh, shell for a rifle. And as we look at these, we can see obviously there's some differences in their size. The smallest being the 22 shell, the largest being the 5.56, which is actually the shell itself is, a, is almost a 2.23, just slightly bigger, um, and not much bigger, but you see it has a much larger powder charge. And that's the thing I want you to keep in mind. It says in our slide here, and, and there's some, some bullets in this slide that I didn't have to replicate or couldn't find a copy of. But it says, we would rightly expect that the bigger shelled bullet will travel with more force and therefore more speed. And this is almost always true. This is true. Now, going to the next slide, it says, but if all of these bullets were shot from guns at the same elevation and at a level position, we ask a question, which bullet would hit first? So if I was to take all of these bullets 
and put them on, in a gun. The guns are all on the same level. And the guns are pointed in a level position. Which one of these bullets would hit the ground first? We're going into the next slide. If you said the smallest bullet, you would be wrong. If you said the biggest bullet, you would also be wrong. They actually all hit at the same time. And the reason for that is that the forces displayed on the y-axis, the up and down or the vertical axis, is independent of any force on the horizontal axis. So the bullet, even though the bigger one may travel faster, may proceed further out than the small bullet, they will both drop and hit the ground at the same time. And they will do that because gravity has the same effect upon each bullet. Now, we're going to uh, talk about an experiment we did to illustrate this point. Now, this is camp meeting. And of course, at camp meeting, we always like to go big at camp meeting. We like to have something really good at camp meeting for our science experiments. We've had you know, our liquid nitrogens, and we've had our fires and pyrotechnics. And we had a really big, good experiment for this. It was so big that some of the staff said we shouldn't do it. They said, this might just not come across right, and we might give young people the wrong idea and try something that wouldn't be safe. So we've changed our experiment here a little bit, at least. So if we go to slide 21, we'll see what we have set up. We have a 22 rifle pointing at a target, and that target uh, is 87 meters away, 87 meters, which is around 94, 95 yards. And you can see the target, and there's a, in the slide we have uh, a picture of the target that's a little blown up, and then we have a view through the optic of the target. Now this target that we set up was 12 and a half inches high, or 0.3175 meters, 31 and 3 fourths centimeters tall. So keep that in mind. That's an important number to remember. And it's important to remember that we were 87 meters away. But we arranged the rifle and we arranged the target to be on the top of the target to be on the same level that the rifle was on. We, we did some sighting with some we would call our primitive surveying equipment. And so the top of the rifle being level was right at the top, pointing right at the top of the target. OK? Now going to the next slide, this gets just a little complicated, but it's not really so hard because we've got it all here on the slide for you. The bullet that we were going to shoot, a standard 22 bullet, travels 1,070 feet per second, or in metrics, about 326 meters a second. But our distance from the target was 87 meters. And so when we divide that out, that tells us that it would take the bullet just a little more than one-fourth of a second from the place it was fired to reach the target, 0.266 seconds, just a little more than one-fourth of a second. Now, on the right side of the slide, we see a formula, and I just copied this from the internet because it made it easy, uh, a formula calculator where you put in the free fall time and the, co the, the, the coefficient for gravity function is, is standard, it's already there. But it will give us the free fall distance. It will calculate in that much time how far an object will fall. And so in 0.266 seconds, an object will fall 0.3469 meters, or 34.69 centimeters. And that is about the same as 13 inches. 13 inches. Now remember, we said that we were lining up the rifle with the top of the box. The rifle on the top of the box. But they're 87 meters away, and in the one-fourth of a second, the object should drop 13 inches. But we said the box was 12 and a half inches tall. 12 and a half inches tall. And uh, the, the picture's a little hard to see through the scope, but we tried to get a picture through the scope. And you can see, if you look closely, that the crosshairs of the scope are in the middle of the box at the top edge of the box. At the top edge of the box. Now let me ask you this. If we fire a bullet that's going to drop 13 inches in 87 meters, and we're pointed directly, sighted in directly ahead, our, our scope's not been, been adjusted for the, the elevation difference, and our bullet drops 13 inches, where on the target will the bullet hit? Where on the target will the bullet hit? Well, you may have got right. 
you've said, wait a minute, it's dropping 13 inches, but the target's only 12 and a half inches high. And so therefore, it should hit below the target. And sure enough, it does. Here we have a three picture sequence taken uh, frames from a, uh, a high-speed camera shot at the uh, target. And if you look just below the target in the left picture, you see there a, a rock. A rock. Now, we didn't place that rock there on purpose. It just happened to be there, but it really worked out well for the experiment. If you look in the middle frame, you see like there's dust being kicked up right in front of that rock because that's exactly where the bullet hit. And if you look at the picture on the left, you see that um, dust coming up uh, a little bit more. And so according to the physics and the law of gravity, the bullet should have hit just below the target. And that is exactly where it hit. If I go to slide 25, here's a picture of the target. And so what we did, we actually uh, raised our, our elevation just slightly, and we got a couple bullets in the bottom of the target. You can see there's a couple at the bottom of the target. And then we raised the rifle significantly above the target, and we got two or three shots at the top. And then we raised, put the rifle at the place that we thought it should hit the target, somewhere in the middle. And you can see that we actually have several in the middle. There's four, five, six, a nice grouping, three right in the, on the bullseye, four in the bullseye area that, that came out real nice and all that. So that just was an illustration, that, an experiment that we did to prove to us that the law of gravity is true, that this formula, uh, d equals 1 half gt squared, is correct. Now, in slide number 26, it tells us simply that gravity is a good friend to us. It's constant and unchanging. And because it's constant, because it doesn't change, we can depend upon it. We don't have to worry about going out to get in a car and not being able to get in because we're floating away. Or that the car goes around a curve and it doesn't hold into the curve because there's not enough gravity. Or maybe there's too much and I can't even move through the, the curve. And so gravity is actually a good thing for us here. It keeps us our bodies in tune where they need to be and is a blessing. But there's another good friend who is constant and unchanging. And that is our friend Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday and today and forever. Just like gravity is a constant for us and we can depend upon it, Jesus is constant and we can depend upon him. In Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 12, it says, And as a vesture shalt thou fold them up, and they shall be changed, but thou art the same, and thy years shall not fail. And so again, God is the same. He doesn't change. In Psalms 102 and verse 27, it says, But thou art the same, and thy years shall have no end. Isn't it good that God is not capricious? What if God was capricious and today he wants to be nice, friendly, and good, but tomorrow he wants to be a tyrant and an ogre to us? We wouldn't know how to approach God. We would be afraid of God. We would think he's nice one day and then not think he's so nice the other day. We would be uh, pleased to be in his presence one day and we would be fearful of his presence the next day. But God is the same. He changes not. There's no variableness, neither shadow of turning to him. In slide 31, it says Jesus and gravity are both good. But remember this, gravity will want to pull you down, literally, where Jesus will want to live you up. And so I encourage you to give your life to Jesus if you haven't done so. Maybe you've been burdened by things of this world. But Jesus says in Matthew chapter 11, verses 28 through 30, he says, Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. He says, Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And this reminds me also of the theme for this week from Psalms 91. Psalms 91, verses 1 through 6. It says, He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God, in Him will I trust. Surely he shall deliver thee from the snare of the fowler and from the noise and pestilence. He shall cover thee with his feathers, and under his wings shalt thou trust. 
His truth shall be thy shield and buckler. Thou shalt not be afraid for the terror by night, nor for the arrow that flieth by day, nor for the pestilence that walketh in darkness, nor for the destruction that wasteth at noonday. So God has been so good. He's given us gravity so that we might keep our feet on solid ground and the best solid place to have our souls implanted and, and, and seated is in our Lord Jesus Christ. So I hope that's been a blessing to you and I want to encourage you now to listen to the mission report from Pastor David. If you We're excited to share with you a few of the things that God is, is doing in spite of, of the obstacles that the enemy wants to place in the way. Um, there has been a tremendous progress, I believe, in the uh, gospel work here in the Philippines. And we read in 1 Corinthians 14, 40, let all things be done decently and in order. We um, have been impressed with this scripture and various others um, in the recent years and been, been striving to bring our lives into um, order in our families, in our homes, in our, in our personal lives um, when it comes to time, when it comes to our surroundings, our our, the orderliness of our own place and, and so forth, but also in the work of God and the church. We read in volume 9 of the Testimonies 258, paragraph 1, that some have advanced the thought that as we near the close of time, every child of God will act independently of any religious organization. But I've been instructed by the Lord that in this work there is no such thing as every man's being independent. The stars of heaven are all under law each influencing the other to do the will of God, yielding their common obedience to the law that controls their action. And in order that the Lord's work may advance healthfully and solidly as people must draw together. Last summer in July, Pastor Allen and, and Pastor John Christoph came and we held a couple of camp meetings. And after the second camp meeting, we had a, a meeting to discuss the need for organization. And... And the subject matter presented at the camp meeting was really perfectly designed uh, to, uh, to go along with this because un unintentionally on our part, but um, in the Lord's providence, it was really, it dovetailed very well because we realized the need at that organizational discussion that if we're going to have unity, it needs to be based on truth. And the, the fundamental truth that we could all agree upon was truth were the historic or are the historic beliefs of Seventh-day Adventists. And as we discussed things, we decided that the 1889 fundamental principles of Seventh-day Adventists were the principles that we needed to found our organization on. And so we... Um, we decided that that we would go through with this, that we would plan a delegation session at the end of September of 2019, and and we we said very plainly in our invitation to to possible delegates that um, that the 1889 historic Seventh Day Adventist uh, beliefs exclude those that that are into new theology, Adhe adherence to the teaching of original sin, holy flesh, live in your sins, situational ethics, no sanctuary, feast days, Jewish names, God does not destroy, etc., etc. Um, these are all not countenanced by that um, historic document of the principles of faith of 1889. So, a group of delegates met together in September of 2019 and organized as the 1889 Historic Seventh-day Adventists. It was a reorganization of Seventh-day Adventists, we believe, based on those original principles because the, the um, mainstream nominal 
professed Seventh-day Adventists of today have departed from the principles that have made it Seventh-day Adventists and can no longer truly be called Seventh-day Adventists. God's blessing has attended this move. We don't have a president, but we have a representative committee and a council led by a chairman. We don't have a corporation. We have a church. Not a church run by a few corporate officers, but we have a church where Christian is united to Christian and church to church, and where every member has a voice in choosing its leaders, and where responsibility is distributed among various people around the Philippines. We have an ordained ministry, gospel workers, local churches, church discipline, a treasury, a missionary training school, and soon by God's grace, a joint publishing work. Our website is still under construction, but we invite you to visit it and um, see what is there and read more about the work and the truths that, that we uphold. The address is https colon forward slash forward slash 1889hsda.org. 1889hsda.org. And that stands for 1889 Historic Seventh-day Adventists. Four ministers have been recognized and ordained or reordained, as the case may be, and some other gospel workers are being partially supported, either by stipends or expenses. 1889 HSDA church buildings are currently being built in three different areas in Philippines, Muchia, Mindanao, Pangil, and Luzon, and also here at Odensian Center in Negros Oriental in what's called the Visayas. Our churches in Pangantukan, Mindanao, and in Palawan already have their own church buildings. Other member churches include Nitao in Mindanao and uh, Mindoro. For those unfamiliar with the geography of Philippines, these places are scattered around Philippines on various islands. Some require more than a day to travel between them by ferry. Gospel workers are supported by the newly organized church and uh, and these have been visiting various groups around the Philippines until the current lockdowns have occurred and, and stopped the travel between islands. For pictures of some of the member churches and some of the work you can check on our website under member churches. You can see those churches that are um, that I've mentioned. Waldensian Center was um, was a missionary school training school that has been in operation off and on since 2007, but um, more recently after the organization of 1889 historic. Seventh-day Adventists. Um, Waldensian Center was restarted after um, after our organizational meeting in September. We we made plans there to restart it, and and at the beginning of January, uh, Pastor Jess Mar, Incoy, uh, Brother Samuel Villaver, and myself and and my wife. Reopened Waldensian Center, Philippines, at our mountain property. And trainees are currently staying in our home. And we're using our porch for services and for classes. Sometimes just uh, our um, couple of bedrooms um, and open area in the house, depending on the, the weather and, and so forth. And we have um, a chapel that is being erected on our property, as I mentioned. There's another building project as well that we've excavated for. It's a multi-purpose building for classes and dining. And we're also in the process of building small huts for housing the trainees. We've finished one of them. Uh, it's called a kubo, which means a small hut. It's large enough just to house two trainees. This has been one of their carpentry projects. When we were trying to get some sand delivered from town for the concrete for the church, 
We could not find anyone willing to deliver it to our village because of the terrible roads and because of the the um, rebel soldiers and, and so forth. They just don't want to come all the way to our, our village. But after earnest prayer, I had a talk with the owner of one one of the places, and he changed his mind and decided he wanted to help since it was for a church. So he agreed to haul the sand to a neighboring village and drop it at the school there. And he even added some extra sand um, as a gift to, to help with the building of the church and, some, and also some cement he threw in for free. And um, God had really touched his heart. This was an answer to our prayers because we were not knowing how to get the sand. We were able to haul the two cubic meters of sand in sacks in the back of our land cruiser. The last 45 minutes to an hour um, to our local village. And then we were able to get a neighbor to haul it on to our property with his wooden sled pulled by a carabao. And as with all of our projects, we hired local people to cut trees and cut it up into lumber with their chainsaws. Chainsaws, by the way, were not allowed a couple of years ago when we were working on our house. At that time, it had to be cut up with two-man hand saws. But uh, we hired Carabao sleds again to haul the lumber to the property and uh, began work on, on the church. Due to the lockdown and also our, our business, working on housing and farming and, and so forth. And also because everything has to be done by hand, whether you're sawing a board or, or planing or, or notching or whatever. We have just a very few tools that are battery operated um, and we charge the batteries on our solar system. But uh, still much of the, the work has to be done the old the old way by hand and uh, and so so it's it's um, building is a little bit slower than it is elsewhere where you have all the, the modern conveniences of electricity and power tools and stuff but uh, we're thankful for for this and also especially thankful that um, that we're learning how to live off the grid. We're learning how to do things simply and naturally and without all of the modern conveniences. I've been surprised here as, as some of our um, teachers have improvised and actually made things um, from scratch that I hadn't even thought of before. We made a, One of our, our staff made a, um, some wheels uh, with wood uh, even made a grinding wheel for the grinder that uh, the the uh, battery operated grinder that spins 10,000 rpm or so and and so it has to be perfectly balanced and he was able to he was able to to make a a grinding wheel by pasting some sandpaper on a block of wood and and made this block of wood perfectly round so it would not vibrate and and just um, made a table saw and um, things that that um, I haven't haven't really thought about even doing before. I would just uh, if something breaks, just go get a new one. But here um, they just fix it, just uh, improvise, do something to make it work. And uh, and this has been a real blessing, especially in the last three months when we've had a lockdown, couldn't go anywhere, couldn't get supplies and so forth. So, um, so we're real thankful for that. But currently on the church, we have um, we're working on the roof, and and uh, it's been slower than we always hope, but it's it's going forward. Our our porch is getting a little small sometimes when we have between 12 and 20 visitors on a Sabbath, and um, so so we're anxious to get that church up. 
Pastor Jessmar's family is living in, an, in their newly built house on the property. And Brother Samuel Villiver was staying in our home and leading out in the Bible-based agricultural program and industrial arts. Samuel majored in theology and is also an electronics repairman, amateur radio operator, bio-friendly farmer, builder, mechanic, welder, inventor, and a jack-of-all-trades. Pastor Jessmar also majored in theology. He's a medical missionary, farmer, treasurer for the 1889 Historic Seventh-day Adventist in Philippines, and is serving as the pastor of our 1889 HSDA local church here at WC, and leading out in community outreach and teaching some of the Bible classes. Formerly, he served as the director in a missionary school and is currently the associate director of Waldensian Center. I am serving as director and teaching many of the classes, and, and my wife is working in the kitchen and home economics department. I'll share with you a, a brief summary of, of our what we're learning here at Waldensian Center, uh, but for a complete specific curriculum, you can visit our website again, look under Waldensian Center. Uh, I'll give you the web address a little later. We're teaching a wide range and a thorough range, actually, of Bible topics, health and medical missionary work, teaching how to use computers and certain applications, uh, website building, uh, including some web languages, bookkeeping. Uh, we're we're uh, learning English and, and Greek some basic um, introductory Greek, that is, sewing and some domestic skills, various building and industrial skills, um, natural agriculture, preparing and giving Bible studies, and there are aspects of character training that can't very well be put in words. Trainees are involved in regular Bible studies with neighbors and are getting practical experience in medical missionary work, serving the community. They're enjoying learning health, academics, agriculture, industrial skills, Bible, etc. Um, the second quarter of the training began April 5. Third quarter begins July 5. Seeds that have been planted several years ago with medical missionary work and personal visitation are being watered and bearing fruit. We've been studying with some, and between 8 and 20 attend Sabbath services regularly, as I mentioned. Currently, there are several studies going on on Sabbath afternoons as well as other days of the week. We split up going different directions to study with the different ones. A group of young people stay here after attending church with us, and we share stories and songs, etc. with them. Some trainees walk 40 minutes to one village, and some walk to another village in the opposite direction about the same distance to give these Bible studies. When Mara and I first came, we used to be daily treating people with their health needs, and that proved to be a wonderful entering wedge for us to visit them in their homes, minister to them, and pray with them. And now the doors are opening in many places for Bible studies. One day a neighbor lady and four youth from our village came to visit us and asked us for, for uh, to study the Bible with them. We dropped what we were doing and welcomed the opportunity. We gave a Bible to one of the teenage girls, and she said she'd been longing for a Bible, and it was an answer to prayer. She was so happy. As we closed that Bible study, one of the trainees arranged to attend a daily Bible study with this girl and three of her friends until we gave the girl um, the Bible. They had only had one Bible between them all, all of these friends, and they would get together just to to be able to share that one Bible between them. But before they left, the husband of the lady came and wanted to talk about religion. He stayed for another hour or so before leaving and promising to attend church on Sabbath. The next week, the trainees attended the Bible study, which was being held in a chapel of another church. That turned out to be possibly not um, quite so wise. Um, but 12 young people attended instead of the three, and some were in tears as the trainees shared the love of God. The trainees came back exclaiming that they were experiencing more joy than they ever had 
had in their lives. Later that week, the Bible students and parents were visited by the priest, who usually only comes once every two months, and he was very angry our trainees were allowed to share with the young people. Even though this was just a gathering of youth, totally at their own instigation, not a formal church function. But the trainees are continuing to share regularly now at the home of one of the Bible students. And by the way, this uh, visit of the priest was the reason I said it turned out not to be quite so wise to to do that in in the chapel of this other church. But uh, anyway, due, due to time and space, we can't begin to share all of the wonderful things God is doing. But we have chosen just a few of the most recent things. At one of our regular Bible studies with a group in the community, we shared the state of the dead. And they were so amazed to hear that the dead are really dead. They involuntarily exclaimed, that means the saints are dead and cannot mediate for us or even hear our prayers. They realized that they could not expect the ghosts of their dead relatives to be communicating with them or expect witch doctors communicating with the dead to be able to help them with their diseases. They confessed that many of the teachings of their church are not based upon the Bible and that they must from now on get their doctrines from the Bible. Last week, five young men, after hiking up for two hours from another village, about 2,000 feet below our elevation, were passing our place. When, like Abraham, we invited them for refreshment. They stayed, and we soon were holding a Bible study, which lasted a few hours. They enthusiastically listened and questioned about the Sabbath and many other subjects. Three of them came back yesterday and brought five others, including their pastor, who questioned and eagerly listened to the truth for almost five hours. When I'm relating some of these things, I'm, I'm reading what I wrote um, a few weeks ago, so the timing is not always um, perfectly accurate, but um, some things I've filled in more recently, some things I've filled in even just, uh, just today. Uh, so... So bear with me on some of the timing, but it's all very recent, all of these experiences I'm sharing. But uh, another person, one of our local first fruits after attending church, declared that she was going to try with all of her heart to keep the Sabbath regularly. Another family that we were studying with from the community were overjoyed to know the truth about the Sabbath, and one lady confessed how she had been sinning by keeping the wrong day for many years. She then urged upon us an unsolicited offering worth about a day's wages for the laborers here in the mountains. In the midst of crisis and laws that could prove to be obstacles by the grace of God, our work here is continually growing as God leads. In the wake of travel restrictions, we are grateful for the warnings of the time of trouble given God's people a century ago to get out of the cities, to grow our own food, and that soon those that would wish to leave the cities would not be able. Our Heavenly Father has been generously providing food for WC Training Center almost completely from our agricultural program and from the farms of neighbors. Through God's providence, neighbors regularly deliver to our door pro produce from their farms. We are growing sweet potatoes of many varieties, cassava, corn, and adlai. Adlai is um, sometimes called Job's Tears. And these are our staples. Added to that from our own gardens and neighbors, we are provided with many other fruits and vegetables and rice. Not having wheat or flour available, we make bread from the many kinds of taro, many varieties of sweet potatoes, many varieties of corn, adlai rice, many varieties of bananas and coconuts. You might find it strange that we make bread from these kinds of things, but we have some very tasty bread made from these things. It's seldom the same from day to day, but it's always good. And we we vary the, the bread. It's not always the same because of the availability of ingredients. One day it might be purple sweet potatoes, or another day it might be, be taro or cassava. We thresh and mill our own adlai and corn in our neighbor's hand crank stone mill. We now have our own sorghum to add to our varieties. 
Our corn is of various kinds, violet, pink, red, pale yellow, bright yellow, and white. We have many varieties of taro, of violet, brown, white, yellow, etc. Different varieties of wild yam collected from the forest. Our sweet potatoes are of every color, shape, size, and texture. We often have a thousand bananas at a time ripening. They too come in a wide range of sizes, shapes, textures, and colors. Coconuts are in abundance. We use the coconut milk for our vegetables and fruits, the pulp for our bread. We use coconut for just about every meal. Neighbors bring us sacks full of avocados for pennies. They would otherwise be thrown to the pigs. Papayas are, are of all shapes and sizes and tastes and have several colors. We just harvested our first pineapple and we have passion fruit from our vines. We are growing quite a bit of pinto beans and red beans and various other beans, cucumbers, lettuce, kale, watermelon, squash, orange and yellow turmeric, red and white ginger, green onions, gold and white cassava, sugar cane of several varieties, tomatoes, etc. We have enjoyed all of this abundance at a time when those in the cities have been trapped, unable to leave even their houses except under certain circumstances or certain days with a pass, many unable to work or earn a living. They have been totally dependent on what the government gives out from time to time. If someone is caught traveling down the road without a quarantine pass, they are quarantined, fined, possibly sent to jail. When a pandemic was declared, the world immediately acted in concert, apparently following orders handed down from a global authority. Cities were locked down, provinces were locked down, countries were locked down. Every country in the world responded in varying degrees, restricting travel gatherings, school, work, etc. In Philippines, we needed to obtain a quarantine pass to travel to town, to enter any store or do anything. The passes were issued by the local village governments, and if you did not officially hold residence in that village, no pass was given to you. Only one pass was given per family, and only one individual could travel outside the home at a time, and then only at specified times, twice a week in many places. Our village ran out of passes, so none of us at Waldensian Center were able to obtain a pass, so for months we were unable to shop for even what we thought were basic necessities like tissue, salt, soap, cleaning supplies, go for medical checkups or sonogram for Mara, who was pregnant, look for a birthing clinic or midwife, if it was not an emergency, which required a special pass of its own, or get our packages that had been sent from America, or shop, or visit nearby Waterfall for a picnic, until the lockdown ended. In a very short time, it was reinstated to a slightly less degree. The transportation was taken over by government and drivers who had previously been organized into groups by the unions, are only allowed to work on certain days, the number of passengers is regulated. Government is paying them now, not the individuals. Travel between cities or islands was prohibited. Government officials came around once offering us a 10 kilogram sack of non-organic white rice and a slaughtered chicken and some dried fish, none of which was useful for us or needed. But they had another 10 kilo of rice available one other time if we had wanted it. Most were not able to work any longer or travel to work if they could, so they gave just over $100. The government gave just over $100 to the families in the community one time, but that had to be picked up on Sabbath. When for a short time the lockdown for our province lifted, one of our staff, Jesmar, traveled to Dumaguete and got some packages sent us and supplies from our house there and did some shopping, then came right back. Fortunately, because the next day the city was locked down again, and he would have been trapped away from his family. Samuel, our staff member, went with him and did get stranded there. He was hoping to be able to travel on to Mindanao to visit his family. He had planned to spend a week or so at home each month and travel back and forth, but he was stuck here for three months, unable to visit the family because, because of this lockdown. And then he was stuck in... Dumaguete at our rented house there for five weeks, filling out documents, getting police clearances, medical clearances, etc., that were required for him to just get on a ferry and travel across to the next island over to his own home. Currently, he's under, he's has been able to travel now to his 
house, but he's under quarantine, if you will. He had a, a difficult time while in the city because transportation costs have doubled, food costs have skyrocketed. Um, not being a resident, he would not have even been allowed to get a pass to leave the house to get food if it were not for the special, special circumstances that he has applied for this other pass to travel home. And so because of that, he was able to apply and get a special pass to shop while he was there. Even when the province-wide lockdown ended for a short time, when meter social distancing was and is required, creating long lines in supermarkets, banks, etc., the cashiers look like they're from outer space with face shields, masks, special clothing, etc. A quarantine pass was required to enter certain banks and certain places, even though the lockdown had lifted. Traveling down the highway, currently vehicles are pulled over and showered with chemicals and passengers have their temperatures taken. For months, no ferry boats operated for passengers between islands until just recently. And like I say, you have to have all this red tape and quarantine to be able to travel. And it takes weeks to process these things. During the lockdown, the public market where farmers and vendors sell their produce and other things in our city was shut down. I don't know what happened to the homeless and street people who normally buy and sell small things at the public market to survive and just live from day to day. Farmers could only sell to government and government was only buying several main staples. Much food has been wasted while people are in need. Many people in the cities have become totally dependent on government. I suspect the time when government I suspect the time will come when government will run out of food. President Duterte has recently declared that schools will not open up until there is a vaccine available. In the meantime, students have had to enroll in special online classes. Devices and internet are a must. Massive school applications have been rolled out, obtaining an immense database on each individual. There are stiff fines of 100 US dollars um, equivalent to that and imprisonment for violators of any regulation. But by God's grace, our local officials have allowed us to continue to hold Bible studies in people's homes and hold our Sabbath worships, etc. Since our province has lightened up the lockdown slightly, Pastor Jess Marr was able to go into our local town yesterday to get a few supplies, but starting today, because of COVID, no one will be able to allow others to ride on their motorcycles with them. Besides riding in the back of a 4x4 dump truck that the city sends now and then to take people to vote or for vaccinations, riding in the back of a motorcycle has been the only means of transportation for most of the people in our mountain village to get to town, even when we could travel that way. It was not easy with the very rough and difficult road. On our last trip up last February, Mara almost had a miscarriage, and from then on, had to almost stay in bed constantly until the birth of our baby in May. I re-injured my neck on that same trip and have had trouble ever since when I strained it even slightly. Our vehicle developed a grinding noise in the transmission about six months ago just after having the clutch replaced and with the school responsibilities, the quarantine and the baby, I've been unable to work on it or even hope to get parts or been able to leave um, and take it out of our village to have it worked on. This has created some tests of our faith because we were unable to get passes because our village ran out of them. We were unable to travel down anyway because of the transportation issue and Mara's delicate health situation, being unable hardly to walk across the room without feeling like the baby was on its way. We were not able to go in for any more sonograms, checkups, to find a birthing clinic, or even a midwife. We finally found some midwives locally and in surrounding villages, but some were spiritualists, sacrificing chickens to the spirits for each child they delivered, and a couple of them were unwilling to help, afraid they would be sued by the American if something went wrong. Others could only do it if we went to the clinic in the neighboring village six kilometers away. We have more than a kilometer to walk from our property to the car, and from there it is a grueling 4x4 road for 40 minutes to an hour to get to either one of those villages. So that did not seem possible. Besides, they said they did not want to help anyway, afraid to help an American, and told us we should go to the hospital. But many others told us the small hospital in our local city two hours 
away over the terrible roads I mentioned would not help us. But that hospital would just send us on to Dumaguete, another three hours away. We realized that that option would cause the baby to probably be born on the back of a motorcycle or back of a car with no one to help and could cause mother and baby to die. We felt we had only one option, and that was to pray for help from God. Two weeks earlier than the due date, she went into labor during worship. We were not sure if it was the real thing or not, as they were not real strong or regular until 10.30 p.m. But then we knew it was the real thing and began boiling water to sterilize some things and getting a few things ready that we had for this emergency. I had the trainees preparing water and basins and towels, etc., outside the room, and one of the trainees who had watched her mom giving birth several times came into the room with myself and Mara. Baby Tav, the 22nd letter of the Hebrew alphabet, was born at 11.30 p.m. God graciously granted health and safety to Mara and the baby. The baby's name is Tav Mayim, both Hebrew words meaning the habitation of the seal of God. Eisel, our trainee that helped, was jubilant to get this hands-on experience in assisting in a delivery. Just as I was writing this paragraph, she sustained a machete injury, which I needed to attend to, with some pine pitch. It seems there is never a dull moment. When she cut herself on a piece of roofing previously, she almost fainted at the sight of blood. But during the delivery, by God's grace, she did great. My dear friends, May God keep you under his shadow as we are entering this global time of trouble, and may we each be found at our post where God has placed us, not managing our lives based upon fear. There is a work to do, young people and old people, and there's very little time to do it. I believe we're entering the last crisis, and we need to be about our Father's business. This report can be found on our website. Also, some pictures. I encourage you to get those and, and look and see what we're doing here and, and the way the Lord is blessing. And uh, the website is, again, https colon forward slash forward slash 1889hsda.org. And follow the links there to Waldensian Center and to the report. And if you wish to be placed on a mailing list to receive updates, please email me at admin at 1889hsda.org or you're free to use one of my other emails if you know those. May God richly bless you is my prayer.